apla what is it how do you diagnose it what are the criteria what is the classification why is there recurrent thrombosis in case of apla how do you manage it let's try to find out everything about apla in this video hi i'm dr sarali jagati senior resident ops and gynae department at scb medical college and hospital katak having secured an all india rank of 3546 in neat pg 2021 so let's dive into the topic. So APLA stands for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. It is defined as an acquired autoimmune condition which is characterized by recurrent arterial or venous thrombosis and or fetal loss. So in this condition, there is uh, antibodies which are formed against the phospholipid binding proteins not against the phospholipids remember that. So it is a misnomer because it is against the binding proteins. Now, uh, if you talk about the incidence, it is around one case per 1 lakh population. What are the antibodies which are involved? The major antibodies which are involved are lupus anticoagulant, anti-cardiolipin antibody and anti beta 2 microglobulin. Lupus anticoagulant can be uh, tested by uh, your Russell, Vipe, uh, Russell Venom Viper test. And anti-cardiolipin uh, antibody and anti-beta-2 microglobulin can be tested using ELISA. Other minor antibodies which are also attributed in uh, your APLA include uh, some of the minor antibodies like prothrombin, annexin-5, phosphatidylserine and phosphatidyl inositol against which these uh, minor antibodies also develop. Then there is a nomenclature known as secondary APLA. So APLA can be primary or secondary. Primary is where you only have the APLA itself. Secondary is when it is associated with other autoimmune conditions. Okay, So other autoimmune conditions can include rheumatoid arthritis or SLE. So this is when we call it as a secondary APLA. Let's try to understand the pathophysiology of APLA. So what are these antibodies doing and why there is so much of uh, thrombosis in APLA? So when these antiphospholipid antibodies are present, they activate your platelets, endothelial cells and even monocytes. So when these are activated, they release your pro-inflammatory mediators. When there is uh, release of this pro-inflammatory uh, mediators because of activation of these endothelial cells platelets and monocytes so what happens there is increased leukocyte adhesion also release of some pro-inflammatory cytokines tissue factor and basically they potentiate your coagulation factor activation so it leads to excessive fibrin production also platelet activation releases thromboxin b2 which causes increased expression of a fibrinogen receptor the net effect, if you see, is the production of a procoagulant state and that causes thrombosis. So in a nutshell, if you have to remember what is the pathophysiology, basically it's, uh, these antibodies are uh, act causing excessive activation of these uh, platelet endothelial cells, monocytes, which uh, ultimately re uh, lead to a prothrombotic state, which cause excessive thrombosis production or a pro uh, uh, thrombosis in the body. Also remember that antithrombin 3 and protein C are also inhibited in APLA because of which there is increase in thrombin and increase in fibrin production. Also it has been seen that there is accelerated atherosclerosis including there is impairment of flow mediated dilatation because of which there is promotion of atherogenesis. So now that we know the pathogenesis of APLA. Now let's see what, are, what can be its implications on pregnancy. So what are its complications and implications in pregnancy? This is what is our topic of interest. In pregnancy, as we have already known by the pathogenesis, it is, a, it is creating a procoagulant state and is causing widespread thrombosis. So in pregnancy also the same thing happens. So this happens at the placental level. So in the placenta, there is increased thrombosis, which leads to placental infarction. Also remember that it causes a procoagulant state at the placental level. Now these things can also cause impaired trophoblast implantation.
when it is causing impaired trophoblast implantation it can also lead to vascular rupture now these things as you know can cause abruptio placenta now remember this and then you will know why in the criteria for diagnosis of apla we also have a uh, criteria for abruption and preeclampsia so this is the pathogenesis which happens in pregnancy let's try to understand what complications it can cause in pregnancy the first and foremost which i already mentioned is recurrent pregnancy loss about the definition and the diagnosis and what are the other causes of rpl i will make in some other video but remember that apla is one of the important causes of recurrent pregnancy loss second it can lead to severe preeclampsia which will be early onset that is less than 34 weeks and uh, it can also lead to severe fgr because of the thrombosis and uh, placental infarction that is in, uh, which it is causing again uh, it can cause oligohydraminosis so as you can see if you know the pathogenesis automatically you will know what is the uh, implications in pregnancy because of only these thrombosis at the placental level it is leading to all these conditions oligo uh, unexplained fgr uh, or unexplained second or third trimester fetal death also can happen non obstetric uh, complications can be venous or arterial thrombosis by definition only we know it can also lead to heart valve defects levator reticularis itp and hemolytic anemia glomerulonephritis and interstitial nephritis cerebral infarctions epilepsy chorea uh, chorea migraine and explain amaurosis for gats postpartum syndrome also is a rare uh, syndrome which is characterized by uh, pleuropulmonary disease fever and cardiac manifestations so these are the com complications in pregnancy which is uh, caused by apla now we have to diagnose it so this is where our criteria come into picture remember that we have a criteria which was named as the saporo criteria which was given in the year 1999 later this has been modified and given as the sydney criteria in the year 2006 this has two uh, broad headings in the criteria one is the clinical criteria one is the lab criteria any one clinical criteria and any one uh, lab criteria is required for diagnosis in clinical criteria we have first is the thrombosis now thrombosis can be arterial venous or small vessel which is confirmed by imaging or doppler studies or histopathology next is the any adverse obstetric event like more than equal to 3 pregnancy losses less than 10 weeks of gestation or more than equal to 1 fetal death more than 10 weeks of gestation or more than equal to 1 preterm birth which was less than 34 weeks of gestation associated with severe preeclampsia or abruption now i hope you understand and you can correlate when i spoke about the pathogenesis of uh, apla in pregnancy why i specified about the vascular thrombosis at the placental level and vascular disruption which again you can see has is related to severe preeclampsia and abruption coming to the lab criteria again lab criteria includes your three major antibodies as i said lupus anticoagulant anti cardiolipin antibody anti beta 2 glycoprotein remember that anti cardiolipin and anti beta 2 glycoprotein it can be igg or igm which is present in medium or high titer this test has to be done 12 weeks apart and repeated only if two tests are positive then only we will call it as a positive lab criteria so remember that it has to be repeated so one apla testing our antibodies if you get it positive you are supposed to repeat for the antibodies again 12 weeks apart so one clinical and one lab criteria when present you will uh, give the diagnosis of apla now let's try to learn about the uh, classification of apla so classification is based on the number and type of antibodies which are positive so first is uh, category 1 category 1 is where more than one apla antibody is positive category 2 two is again divided into a b c 
A is only when lupus is positive. B is when anti-cardiolipin is positive. C is when an only anti-beta-2 glycoprotein is positive. Positivity for all the three antibodies, that is triple positivity, obviously has greater impact on the clinical outcome than double or single uh, this thing. So you can see that if she is a category 1, then obviously she has more adverse outcome uh, rather than 2A, B or C. Now let's try to understand the management of APLA. Now this we'll have to learn with help of some scenarios. Now suppose first scenario is when she is a diagnosed case of APLA with a history of recurrent pregnancy loss. For this we are going to start her with low dose aspirin plus prophylactic dose of low molecular weight heparin. Now this low molecular weight heparin is started only after you have uh, clinically uh, uh, or documented the cardiac activity in the fetus. Prophylactic low molecular weight heparin is once a day dosing of enoxaparin 40 mg subcutaneous. This heparin has to be also continued 6 weeks postpartum. Remember, next is the if she is APLA positive with a history of venous thromboembolism. For this, we have to start the therapeutic dose of heparin along with low dose aspirin. This has to be continued 6 weeks postpartum. Okay? And when you are continuing in the postpartum period, you can switch over to the prophylactic dose of heparin. So what is this therapeutic dose of heparin? Therapeutic dose of heparin means full dose you are going to give that is enoxaparin but it is given 1 mg per kg body weight and it is given 12 hourly. Usually it is given for 7 days. In this your target factor 10A level should be 0 0.6 to 1 unit per ml. So remember that we are giving it under two headings therapeutic and prophylactic and this what we are speaking is about the unfractionated heparin. So, uh, when she has a history of venous thromboembolism, you are going to give her a therapeutic dose. And when she only has a history of recurrent pregnancy loss, then you are giving her a prophylactic dose of low molecular weight heparin. Suppose she is a case of APLA with recurrent pregnancy loss or stillbirth, then you are going to give her low dose aspirin plus prophylactic dose. As I said, after delivery, you are going to continue again with heparin plus aspirin. Now suppose a patient comes to us without any history of recurrent pregnancy loss or any uh, significant clinical features but she has done a uh, APLA testing, antibody testing and she comes to us that doctor I have done APLA uh, testing because I was advised by some other clinician and here this antibody tests are positive so what am I supposed to do? So in this case when she does not have any history uh, of recurrent pregnancy loss or stillbirth or no clinical features of uh, suggestive for APLA and only antibodies are positive so in this case you're only going to give her low dose aspirin suppose in another clinical scenario she's a primary gravida who comes to us with a uh, first time uh, she is pregnant and she has done her APLA uh, antibody testing which comes out to be positive so again you are only going to give her low dose aspirin which is similar to a prophylactic low dose aspirin which we start for preeclampsia patients so i hope that in this you have clearly understood the management of uh, APLA so whenever a patient comes to us with APLA antibodies you have to try to understand that what is the clinical scenario she is fitting in Okay, so in this you will know whether to start a therapeutic dose of heparin or a prophylactic dose of uh, heparin and in which condition you are going to continue 6 weeks postpartum also. Now what are the other drugs which can be given apart from heparin? These are uh, hydroxychloroquine, statins, corticosteroids and IV immunoglobulin. This is given in catastrophic antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. What is catastrophic antiphospholipid antibody syndrome? This is where three or more organ system involvement is present and most common prominent being the CNS involvement. This is a rare condition which is seen in less than 1% patients of APLA. This is rapidly progressive thromboembolic disorder in which uh, there is 50% mortality. 
as i said prominent is cns involvement so there can be uh, arterial or venous thrombosis rarely there can be psychiatric symptoms also so in this case we can use iv immunoglobulin also so i hope in a nutshell i have tried to uh, help you understand the apla which is very very important topic as far as all your exams are concerned and also in your clinical settings in which uh you will come across recurrent pregnancy losses and it's very important that once a patient comes to you with testing how do you manage her further so any doubt you have please feel free to write at the comment section i'll be glad to clarify i have used uh, your uh, recent guidelines from rcog acog the williams textbook and ian donald as my source uh, also try to uh, concise it for you Uh, thank you and have a great day